Father's house. How are you guys doing? Hey, we want to welcome our Greece campus. Oh my Lord. Stop it. Stop it. Stop, stop, stop. You guys freak me out. Don't clap so loud. The expectation is killing me. It's like, what if I bomb out? You go like, yeah, I clapped like two minutes too long for this one. Listen, I want to make sure that you understand we give Jesus all the glory. He's the only one that's famous in this place. He's the only one that's worthy. Only one. Only. He gives his glory to no man. I appreciate your love, but we reflect the honor to Jesus. Hey, Greece campers, those who are joining us online, thank you so, so much. So I said this morning, as I walk into this place every week, I come with trembling hands. It may look easy to you, but as I drive to church, trembling, because I stand here on behalf of heaven. I'm here interpreting the heart of Jesus to you. And I want you to pray for me, as I'm going to be praying for you, my son, when he was small. Uh, remember Veggie Tales? My son had the outfit. Bob the tomato everything. When he gets out of the shower, he's got the Bob tomato slippers, the red gown, everything Bob the tomato. And on the Saturday nights, I would pray for church, and he would come lying next to me, and he goes like, I go like, what are you doing? I'm, I'm praying with you. And then I would pray, and i go like, it's your turn. And he always said this, God, help my dad not screw up, please. <laughs> always. And I'm going to ask as I pray for you, because you know, I know where you sit. There is always a war raging for your heart, for your mind. I am clear that where you sit, I sit all the time. And I want you to know when arguments break out on the inside of your mind, it's a sign that the enemy is just contending for your soul. So if you get angry, I don't get afraid. It should tell you that there's value in you. So any resistance, it's supposed to be a resistance. And as we position ourselves today to be part of what God is calling, listen, I was standing in the shower this morning and all week I'm praying what I've asked you to pray. God, what do you want us to do as a family? Have you ever prayed and hoped that God would not answer? Have you ever go like, God, what do you want us to do? Go light. Please go light. <laughs> Please go light. And the Lord didn't say nothing. And I came to an amount in my head. I'm going like, yep, I feel that's fair. Until this morning. I washed my hair early. Prayed early. And I go like, oh, sweet Jesus. But I know usually when God asks of us and the our stomachs, our butterflies are flying everywhere and you want to rebuke every one of them and go like, get behind me, Satan. You know, in that moment, I go like, God, if you tell my wife the same thing, how, how many of you love to put hurdles in God's way? <laughs> same thing, Jesus. So I wrote the check out because today I'm going to pro prompt you to hear from heaven yourself. I don't want to make you do nothing. So you safe, safe, 100% safe. It's the Holy Spirit that speaks to our heart. And I said, baby, what did, what did you pray? She gave me an amount. I go like, baby, pray again. She gave me an amount. Baby, pray again. And she said nothing. So I walked off to service. I go like, I'm keeping this envelope. And just before I came in for worship, she says, it is this, right? And this time I had to go like, I'm good. Because God, you never take from us. You never, you never take from us. You test us in our faith and invite us into a miracle. So today, Heavenly Father, come on, you pray for me. Today, Holy Spirit, ah, only you can come and rest in every heart. Because my heart, like every human heart, somehow hold on to what makes us feel safe. And I thank you that today that you will give listening ears and soft soil in the hearts. 
God, I thank you that not a single person in this place will feel the manipulation or the leaning in of a human heart and a human will. God, we say yes to what you say yes. Give us the willingness, Father, to be part of the miracle heaven of heaven around us. So Holy Spirit, gather us in, those who are far, gather us in. Those who feel that they have failed you this week, thank you that your steadfast love is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God, there is not one person hearing my voice that is unlovable by you. We can never take it too far where your love cannot rescue. So online at our Greece campus and in this campus here, Thank you, thank you, Holy Spirit, that every word is weighted and it's driven by the breath of heaven. We honor you in Jesus' beautiful name, and everybody shouts, Amen. Amen. Come on, why don't you take your seats right now, and I'm going to encourage you to high-five the person next to you and say, aren't you lucky, because I smell great, they sit next to me today. It is so awesome to be here. I'm excited. Really, really excited. I want to take you into the message. And I want to tell you about a time, August 28, 1963. Some of you potentially may uh, recognize that date really quick. All you Tribu Pursuit history people. August 28, 1963, the March on Washington was much bigger than they ever expected. It is a march for the first time that over 250,000 people marched onto Washington. It was a sight to behold. Throughout the program, different speakers, different people came and there came a woman, her name is Mahalia Jackson. She's a gospel singer. Oh, and she stepped up to that microphone, and I've watched this clip. Beautiful. Because out of the depths of her soul came this echo. She sang the song, I have been bucked and I've been scorned. All the people could feel that song, that, that old gospel song just reverberating through the atmosphere. And then with all the cameras on the podium, broadcasting that moment to a national audience, Dr. Martin Luther King stepped up to the podium. And in his own words, he began to address a large amount of people and the vast unknown of those who are watching. He began to say things that Clarence B. Jones wrote on a piece of paper. He pointed out right in the beginning that the country's founders signed a promissory note that offered great freedom and great opportunity. But he noted that instead of honoring that sacred, sacred obligation that America has given the Negro people a bad check, that that check has come back insufficient funds but the atmosphere was tempered there was a strange tension that was hanging in the atmosphere then Mahalia Jackson out of the crowd behind him realized what's going on and she shouted these words tell them about the dream Martin tell them about the dream now Clarence Jackson, who wrote the script for the speech, said Dr. King looked towards her, and he moved the speech to the side, and he began the mantra, I have a dream. Oh, he began to say things like, I have a dream that my four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. Oh, when he began that, something began to erupt among the people because you know you don't have to defend the dream. 
You don't have to prove a dream. He said these words, I have a dream. Transforming the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. I have a dream. Oh, I love the phrase. Because if you ask anybody, what was the speech about? They go like, oh, it was about I have a dream. No, it wasn't about I have a dream. It turned to I have a dream. And what's beautiful about a dream, it doesn't need to silence anybody's argument. Because it doesn't have to prove or defy logic. The dream has the power to stare the mountain of impossibility in the face and look right past it and see what can be if we just believe that our dreams are possible. You see, dreams are prophetic in nature. You go like, what is prophetic? Prophetic in nature means that I can see with my eyes through the invisible, what you cannot see. And I believe that it's possible to this extent that I am willing to go through the mountain, through the river, around the other side. But I will not be stopped by what I see. But because beyond this, there is a dream of life and hope and freedom. I have a dream. Now, have you ever considered that God has a dream? Have you ever considered that throughout all eternity that God Almighty look at this world and He looks at the, the mess that sin has created, how sin has marred and scarred and vandalized and, and destroyed the beauty of what God created when He looked and it said it was good. You do know God has a dream as He looks at the image bearers, his sons and his daughters, so many of them disconnected from the very life-giving breath that comes from him, who is walking in their own stubbornness, who's walking in their own decree, disconnected from the life of God. Do you understand that to this day, God looks and say, I have a dream. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible, because you do know that this is not an open-ended story. The Bible says there is a beginning and there will be an end. And God has an end to where he declares, let me tell you the dream and what will be at the end. And I'm going to ask that you read with me in Revelations chapter 11 verse 15 so loud that you annoy the person next to you. Come on, help me preach. Come on, Greece campus. Everybody out loud. Revelations 11, 15. Here we go. It says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, Come on, the kingdoms of this world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever more. In other words, God says at the end, no matter what the messes the world is in, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of his Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign, and he says, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Lord. That's the end of it. But here you and I are sitting and we're not in Revelations yet. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, we're not there yet. We, we're just not there yet in Revelations. So the question is, what do I do between God's dream and Revelations? And here I stand in the middle of not there, but not there either. The disciples asked Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Because we are standing in the middle of what will be and what is. And Jesus taught them these words. Come on, join me. Come on, Greece campus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Come on, here we go. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. In other words, Jesus says this is what you've got to pray daily. That the kingdom of God breaks through into this world daily that this broken world will experience the wholeness of heaven somewhere daily 
that loveless people somehow will feel the breakthrough of God's kingdom and experience the, the life-changing transformation of the love of God somewhere. And I don't know about you, but I stand as a witness that the kingdom of God break through my life when I was yet a sinner. God saved get his son and he saved me when I was 13 years old. The kingdom break through in my life. The kingdom breaking through in our lives. You see, I believe with all of my heart, every restorative act of God. Listen, I, I would write this down. It's initiated by a prophetic vision of the future. future. What does that mean? It's a picture of what could be if God was present right now. It is filled through love and compassion. And it's carried out and made possible through the spirit of generosity, open-handedness. And every time the kingdom breaks through, it gives God the glory. Because He is the King of His kingdom. So I want to share with you a story that I know, not a story, it actually happened in Scripture. And I know many of you have heard this. And I'm so scared to begin to read this because I'm scared that you're going to go like, yeah, I've heard this. Really? You're going to preach on that? I came so far. I got pretty for that. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not like nothing you've ever heard. Come on. Like nothing, nothing you have ever heard. Because this is the story where you and I discover our part in the partnership that God has in heaven. Because somehow God sovereignly decided that he is going to partner with people on the earth and he's going to work heaven's dream through heaven's sons and daughters. Somehow God decided that I trust people whose lives have been transformed. I have faith that they will hear my voice and trust me that together we will do great things. The Bible says those who know their God shall do exploits. That means super abundantly more than your mind can conceive. God says that's what I'm going to do with my children because Jesus says this as the Father sends me, so I send you. Now, listen, let me get to this camera. Greece campus, Childlike campus. The first thing that the enemy would love to do in your life is to disconnect you from the reality that God wants to partner with you. That you step back and go like, not me, them. I can see them, but not me. I'm here to say to you today, God's desire is to partner with you through your life so that the kingdom can break through where you work. The kingdom can break through where you live. The kingdom can break through around Thanksgiving table with all the demon-possessed family that you have. The kingdom can break through in your trials. The kingdom can break through in your addictions. The kingdom can break through in the brokenness. The kingdom can break through where Wherever you are, you are on assignment of heaven. And God says, with you, I can let the kingdom break through. So the story starts in Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Come on, let's read it together. And I encourage you to take out your smartphone and take some notes. Thou shall not go onto Facebook in the house of the Lord. If you do, uh, I will point to you uh, because I can see the reflection in your glasses. So don't do it. But you can make a note. This is what the Bible says. Come on, let's read it together. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. And he had, come on, shout it out, compassion. Why is it that the Bible talks about a feeling when Jesus sees the people? Because you know that we as human are moved by feelings. Without feeling, we are unmoved. That's why every single ad that comes up for abandoned pits is made so heart-wrenching. I don't even like pits, but I sit and cry at an ugly dog. Why? They want you to feel. Because if you can feel, they can move you to do something about it. But the first thing that you and I usually feel, and that's what I feel for those ads, is pity. Come on, shout pity. Uh, pity is very low level, like, oh, that really stinks. Not nice to be you right now, but it does nothing but feel low grade. Ah. Uh -huh. The second thing is sympathy. 
Sympathy says, I care and I have a concern for your suffering. And my desire is that it would be different, but it stops at a desire. Oh, you look hungry. Oh, my desire is that you will not look hungry at all. But I do nothing about your hunger. I just have a wish that you were not hungry. And all of us have experienced pity. All of us have experienced sympathy when we look to something. And that's something. And the next thing is empathy. Come on, shout empathy. Empathy brings us a little closer because it's the ability to recognize and share the emotions of another person. And the only way we can do that is to get in their shoes, to climb in their pain, to look through their eyes, to hear their story, to feel their need. Listen, you will never understand poverty unless you live in poverty. You will never understand somebody's desperation of addiction until you yourself face the, the, the drama and the trauma of addiction yourself. But I can tell you one thing, empathy is not where we need to stop. Because empathy just says, I feel what you feel. But empathy has to lead to compassion. Because compassion, hey, how many of you remember Popeye? Come on. Come on, preach with me right now. Come on, Greece campus, how many? Wave at me, show your age, show your age. Show your age. Some of the younger people, you go like, like, pop what? Pop why? Pop why? No, no. Remember Olive. Olive is always up to nonsense, right? Olive is a loose goose. Olive is always doing nonsense. And, and Popeye gets to these moments and then he eats what? Spinach. What is the thing he says before he eats the spinach? I can stand it no more. That's what some of your wife says when she's asked you to take the dishwasher out for the 49th time. I can stand it no more. Listen, you know what sympathy is? Sympathy says, no, no, no. I can stand this no more. Sympathy gets you out of your car and embrace a, a wayward dog like it's yours. You don't care for the flea, for the flea and the ticks you cannot stand it I remember driving out in South Clinton and in the middle of the street stood a little boy and I'm looking around and you know I'm I'm from Africa I, I ain't afraid but South Clinton ain't no joke because <laughs> like I've, I, I've, I, I'll put it on like what you gonna do Come on now, if you live in South Clinton, man, God bless you. You know what I did? I put my arms around that kid. I go like, if the dad comes out, we're going to talk. I don't care how big he is. Because there's a two-year-old in the middle of the street and there's no parents here. I ain't letting this boy stand there and go like, hey, go home. See you. Uh -uh. I cannot stand this any longer. I have to do something. If I get punched in the face, glory to Jesus. Uh, I've got a story to tell one day, and I will sue you. And so, so I'm like, I've got to do something. When last have you been moved by God in a way that you say, I have got to do something? Because if we are not moved anymore, could it be that our lives have become so well adjusted that the kingdom of God cannot break through our lives. You have no story of miracles. You have no story of wonders. Your life is pretty boring because your dream is just about yourself. I can tell you that when you begin to realize that God has a plan. Let me get on with the story because the Bible says Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them. Come on, keep reading verse 35. Come on, Greece campus. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. The good disciples, they go like, Ooh, he's facing a problem. Because if you go read, the Bible says it was 5,000 men with their families. So work out. There's probably eight, 9,000 people in front of the disciples go like, oh, big problems. So they state the obvious. We're very good at stating the obvious. And then they were presumptuous. 
First of all, they are presuming that people have money to go buy food. The second thing, they are presumptuous and thinking there's enough food when 10,000 people come to your village. Now, Jesus answered something that is quite shocking. Come on, verse 37. Oh, turn to your neighbor and say, hold on to your seat, Bobby. Here it comes. Mark 6, 37. But Jesus said, come on now. <laughs> say it to me. Come on. Jesus said to them, what do you think they heard? I would go like, say what? <laughs> this is what I think I would hear. Uh, did you not check your discipleship contract of employment? You're supposed to take care of these kinds of things. Don't mess with me with these things. I do miracles. You are the party committee. You should have taken care of this business right now. You stink as a disciple right now. I'm going to demote you. That's what I would hear. When Jesus says, you feed me because we're at an impasse. How? How do I feed 10,000 people? You, you know, let me tell you what, what I think. The response is a logical response because verse 37, come on. What did they answer? They say, with what? And I can say this to you. Our first reflex, our first reflex when we see need is always rooted in logic. I would write it down. Like, what do you mean I should do something about it? Don't you know that I live paycheck to paycheck? And don't you know that the town of Brighton just upped the taxes? And don't you know that uh, my car's half a payment behind? And don't you know my kids now want to go to a different school? And apparently they need good shoes in that school. And you know what I mean? Logic, Jesus. And they go like, do what? Feed us, feed them? I ask the question, what do you think Jesus wished they heard when he said, you feed them. I wrote this down. I think Jesus wished that they would heard. Hey, you have followed me and seen the hand of God in unexpected moments. And to each one of you, God has already given a measure of faith. Today, I know that you can measure and wrestle and manage past the reflex of logic that is so true to you as a human. But today as you choose to believe, you will know the one who asks is also the one that can multiply. And today, all I am seeking from you is obedience and willingness, faith like a child, faith that looks at the reality of what is, but you've got your eyes fixed on the God who doesn't care about what is, because He's able to do far more than your minds can ever conceive. And you, in the middle of a moment where the kingdom of God can break through in such a way that history will record this, they will preach about this, you will be in the middle of it. And the only thing that you need to understand that your response is the tipping point whether this is going to happen or not happen. You are a deciding factor because you plus generosity is hope. What is generosity? It means my hands are open. Me and open hands. And why can my hands be open? Because finally I realize that God is my source. He is the one who supply in my need. We say it so easily, but you really believe it when your hands are open, when your hands are closed. It is a sign that your words believe it, your heart does not. You plus generosity is hope. Mark 6, 38. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's got three more pages. It's now heating up, baby. It's heating up. Come on. Mark 6, 38. Come on, Greece campus, everybody in this room. Then Jesus says this, how much bread do you have? He asked. Watch, watch, watch. And then he says, go and find out. Now, I love this. Because Jesus is saying, don't state the obvious. Go look for the exception. I love this. I love this. You've got to see it. Jesus says, how much bread do you have? If I'm standing there, I go like, nothing. I'm quick. I know. Nothing, Jesus. He says, no, 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 no. Go find out. 
How much do you have to give to people in need? Nothing. Go find out. You know that $20 that you stuck under your carpet in your car to hide it from your spouse? You know that 20 bucks whenever you swing by and get your McFlurry and you, you hide your mouth and you hide it? Yeah, that's your stash right there. That stash is, did you know that that stash is God ordained for a miracle down the road? You know some of you got your taxes back and you go like, oh praise God almighty, Jesus does love me. I got more than I ever expected. Yeah, it's not all yours, baby. That is it. That's the bread that he says, go find it. Go find it. Listen, just stay with me for one second because that's so interesting. Second Corinthians chapter 9 verse 10 says this. For God, come on, is the one who provides the seed for the farmer and bread to eat. In the same way, he provides and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. In other words, God says every time you get paid, listen, some of it's for you to use and eat and some of it, it is seed. Don't eat your seed, baby. Because your seed is so that God can grow generosity in you. Why? Because you and generosity equals hope. Without God finding people with open hands, the whole world is going to remain hopeless because God sovereignly chose to work through people. I love how this goes. Mark 6, 38, we're almost there. Jesus says, how much bread do you have? Go and find it. And they came back and reported, come on, we have five loaves and two fish, and they should add it this, and a whole bunch of angry, hungry people. Because I would go to Jesus and go like, hey, this $20 is going to make no difference when it comes to the need of people. And I know Jesus would say this, how are you to decide that what I can do with that 20? Because you're giving me five loaves and two fish for about 10,000 people. 10,000 people. It is not your worry how I'm going to feed them with what you bring. Your worry is to trust me and bring me what you find. Because of the compassion, what you have. Father's house, every restorative act of God is an answer to a people need in this world and the father's house God has position in front of us opportunity for the kingdom of God to break through in this little handout that you received now I'm going to encourage you to open it to this page would you there is no obligation for you to open it a uh, Greece campus when you touch this doesn't mean you obligate it I just want to take you through so that you see, just stay, just stay with me. Just stay with me just for a second. We're almost there. Do you know that world hunger right now sits at 842 million people that goes to bed hungry every night? 842 million, the least of these. And our desire, as you can see, with Feed My Starving Children, is to provide 250,000 meals and, and everybody in our campuses that has been involved to package those meals for the last three years. Would you wave at me? Would you wave at me? It is spectacular. It is spectacular when the big trucks come in with the beans and the rice and the soy and, and we all put on those strange hats and, and, and the booties and the gloves and, and our campuses become factories and we package all these meals. Do you understand that every penny you give now goes to somewhere and you are connected to the heart of the kingdom of God that is broken through somewhere that you may not know. The gift of heaven multiplied is now where people are hungry. $10,000 is going to go to feeding 1,500 people in Haiti. And if you've ever been in Haiti, what is most shocking to me is to see how they make mud pies and they eat dirt. 
just to make the hunger pains go away. I see an opportunity with you to feed 1,500 children by providing grain for 10,000. Training pastors in four cities in Spain. We've been there twice now. and There's 92, 93 pastors that we are helping to rest restore a faith that life-giving churches is possible and can change the world with the grace of Jesus. I have never seen an area where the parents, the grandparents paid so much for what they believe. For most grandparents in Spain that believe like you believe has been in prison for their faith. Yet, it's a hard place. But we believe with our love and help, it can change our life center. $10,000 is going to go to a day of hope. Come on, shout day of hope. Oh, day of hope is spectacular. And this year, I pray if you've never been to our downtown life center, the day of hope is so great. People who are in, in the trade of cutting hair, they line up seats and, and they cut people's hair that hasn't had their hair cut for months. We provide love and dignity. The kingdom of God breaks through in backpacks. It is so spectacular. And lastly, God behind bars. I am so excited because God behind bars is so spectacular. We had a, our telephone interview this week about New York State and it's as simple as this. The Father's house will provide all the equipment that we will set up a place in one of upstate New York's prisons. They give us the opportunity to make it as nice as it is here. Because they say so many times somebody just brings an old TV, they sit on plastic chairs, and they've got to have church on an old TV. But what we can do is provide an experience. Listen how fantastic this is. Where we will have a worship team that will go out. We will have a campus pastor in that prison that will go out. We will live stream our services to them and to their family at the same time. After service, they allowed a phone call to talk about their experience. Then over Christmas, we as a church provide gifts that we don't wrap because we create our own little mall in prison for the parents to go shop in our mall to buy gifts and then they wrap it up. They put their names on it so that it restores dignity to them as parents. And then what we do is we open our hearts so that they can find a home church that believes that God is the God of the second and the third and the fourth. I know some of you go like, no, this is freaking me out, man. I don't want to go to a church where I've got to watch my stuff. Well, let me tell you this. If God marked my transgression, I would have had a long time, long life sentence, and so would you. Pastor Herbert Cooper was the one that introduced me to God behind bars. And I want you just to sit back. Turn to your neighbor and say, five more minutes and we can go. Five more minutes. I want you to just listen to a story that came out of their congregation. Look at this. I lost my mom when I was nine. And my earliest memory was of my grandpa dying in a hospital bed. I lost so many people that I felt like God didn't even like me. I was addicted to drugs and self-harm since I was 14. I tried to kick my habit, but I never could. And when I was 21, I ended up in prison. One day, another inmate invited me to go to church, and reluctantly I went. That Sunday, in Mabel Bassett, I cried the entire time. I heard Pastor Herbert speak, and he said, God wants good things for you. For the first time in my life, God's love was real to me. In February, I was released from prison and I found my new home at People's Church. I'm now enrolled in Growth Track, and I'm excited for the freedom I have found in Jesus. I'm no longer broken. I'm free. Come on. Come on. You know what is so amazing? That the vision of transformation is what releases generosity in us. When we begin to envision stories like that, and we can be a part of this. I wrote this down. 
Gener generosity always releases what is most precious to us. It never holds what it loves. It gives. Because the Bible says Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He held it up to heaven and blessed it. And they began to hand it out. And God multiplied it. He multiplied it to such an extent that all the people ate to fill. The little boy that gave the five loaves and two fish, he gained seven pounds right there on the day. He had so much to eat. The Bible says the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover. Because our God doesn't just repay you. He overpours blessing upon blessing. But the thing that you and I, all of us, have got to overcome is the fear. Come on, shout fear. Let me get you close to this camera as I can. You look at the side screens. I can't get closer than this. Every one of us, including I, my wife, all of us, we face a fear. Every time there is an opportunity to give. A gift that can bring the kingdom of God into hard places. Our fear is that when I give, I have less for myself. When I give, I'm in a worse state than I was before I gave. Here is my question that I want to ask you. Is it ever possible for you to love so much and so often that at the end of four days of loving everybody you see, you come home and go like, honey, my soul is empty. I've given all my love away. I am so, de I'm depressed right now. That's why you shouldn't love everybody. No. Every time you love, you, you get enlarged in your love. Your life gets, it inhales more love. That's why they say when you're depressed, love people. Because when you love people, love begins to grow. Because it's got a regenerative root. Regenerative root in you on the inside. In other words, you see the fruit. You take it and you give it. You turn back. Now there's two. You go like, oh my goodness, I didn't know there's two. Let me give these two. You come back. Now there's four. Why? Because there is a regenerative, regenerative that root that she's talking about. It regenerates. It doesn't take away. Generosity begets generosity. And I have a dream in this house. If Martin, Dr. King can have a dream, I have a dream. I have a dream that we will become a church like Bible says about Jesus. And Jesus went about healing all. All, all, all. He goes to a village and heals all of them. He frees all of them. And the Bible says, but in Nazareth, he could do no miracles because of their unbelief. I have a dream as your pastor that we will all step into a place of trusting God with whatever he asks. I have a dream that we all say yes. When God says, hey, I have an opportunity, we shout yes. Some of you shout yes with a dollar. Some of you shout yes with 10. Some of you shout yes with more. Some business people shout yes with a large check because I have a dream that everybody responds every single time that God says, Father's house, I have a dream that I want to reach through you and together we can see the kingdom break through of our lives I have a dream today but you and I need to say yes and we have to be gutsy we have to be determined it's going to make you scared you're going to go like Oh, really, God? Because I have decided in my heart, in my life, I've never seen God ask and not multiply whatever is given. Change the world around us and pour His blessing back into our lives in measurable ways. So, Father's house, I want to remind you that you and generosity equals hope and in closing the question that I asked how determined was God with his generosity how determined was he did he was he tentative with his love was he yeah I'm gonna try and send my son I don't know about it mm. 
you know I love him a lot. You know what the song says. There's no shadow you won't light up. There's no mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. There's no lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases me. Fights till I am found. It leaves the 99. I don't earn it. I don't deserve it. Yet you gave yourself away. When I was yet a sinner. Stubborn. That's why I say. Groups. The Bible says in Hebrew. Let us consider ways. To stir. And encourage each other. To good works and faith. Serve teams. Look each other in the eye and say, let's leap. Let's not crawl. Businessmen, I pray that God would stir in your heart to such an extent that you will be paralyzed by God's expect expectation and go like, yeah, okay, God, I'm taking the adventure. 